Luke chapter 6 this morning. If you turn with me, Luke chapter 6, we have been in a series that we have called Great Expectations. We have talked about the expectations that we place on people um, and even God. Expectations absolutely can mess up any type of relationship. Now, before we dive in, here's the reality of this morning, what we're going to be looking at. Uh, the fact of it is, in our culture, we are starving for relationships. We're starving for them. Um, we will omit everything else. We, we will omit our problems, like if you are here this morning and you've had a drug problem, you'll omit that. If you have an alcohol problem, you'll omit that. But very few of us are willing to admit that we have issues in relationship. Relationships are something difficult for us. We don't like to admit that we're lonely. But everything in us says that we are lonely people. Every statistic says that in, in reality, we are getting more and more isolated from people. And this is coming especially in play in health. What's interesting, there are some studies, and I want to share this with you just to build the case as to what we're going to look at this morning in Luke. Um, it's interesting, some studies have been done, and they have found a connection between friendship and health. In fact, there was a study done by the American Medical Association Journal. Listen to this. 276 volunteers were injected with the common cold virus. Now, first of all, I don't know why you would volunteer for that, but 276 of them volunteered, and they studied them. And they found that those who had healthy friendships were 10 times more likely to resist the cold. Think about that. There's a health benefit to healthy friendships. Healthy friendships of people who have a heart attack are three times more likely to survive the heart attack if they have healthy relationships. Proven fact three times more likely to survive. Cancer. It is easier to beat the odds of cancer, statistically true, if you have healthy relationships. There is a benefit to healthy friendships. In fact, Timothy Smith, a professor at BYU, did a study. In fact, he studied studies. He studied over 148 studies with over 300,000 participants. And he said this. He said, an unhealthy a relationship, a bad friendship is as worse as smoking 15 cigarettes per day on the stress level of your life. Now, that does not mean, well, I've got no friends, so I might as well go, just go smoke a pack. That's not what I'm saying. He's saying that the detriment to our health of not having good friendships is like the health, health uh, depreciating of smoking 15 packs a day. And the author who wrote a book called Bowling, Al Bowling Alone said someone, here's his stat, someone with healthy friends but with an unhealthy body is more likely to live longer than someone who's a health nut but has no friends. That was his finding in his study called Bowling Alone. He said this, he said that you can actually, if you have healthy friendships, be unhealthy in your body and live longer than someone who's a health nut but doesn't have any good friendships. So here's, I think, the moral of the story. Grab a Twinkie and eat it with friends. <laughs> right? There is a health benefit to relationships. If you're going to go down, go down with a box of Twinkies and your friends. That's what I'm saying. That's the way. That's what I want to live. Now, am I saying, and am I trying, am I trying to close down Planet Fitness or Gold's Gym? No. The point of this is to say that there is a health benefit to close relationships. The health benefit is seen. Now, that's one side of the coin. But we also know that our culture is actually, is actually f moving farther away from actually healthy relationships. In other words, in Duke, Duke University, there's a, a professor named Lynn Levin, a, a woman professor who did a study for 20 years on friendships. From 1985 to 2005, she focused on uh, how many people in America feel isolated? This, listen to this. This is amazing. She found out that in 1985, 10% of the American population felt isolated, meaning they had no confidant or no friends. In 2005, that rose to 25%. Today, it is estimated that 30% of Americans say they have no friends. Now, think about this. If you look to your left and look to your right, one of you three would say today that you do not have friendships or a healthy friendship. One in every three. That was her findings. In 1985, 
the average person had three friends. In 2005, the average person had two friends. Today, the statistic is 0.5 friends. I don't know how you get a half a friend, but that's the statistic according to numbers. There is each person has about a half a friend. That's the, the, the average. Does anybody know, by the way, in those 20 years, what the most popular sitcom on TV was between 1985 and 2005? Friends. Isn't that funny? Isn't that ironic? And most interesting is in 1985, 57% of all friends were actually family. In 2005, the number of family who were friends was nearly 80%. In other words, today, up to 90% of people that consider themselves friends are actually family with the people. Now, you might say, well, that's a good sign for families, isn't it? No, no, no. In fact, what is happening is because families are weakening at a rate higher than our friendships are weakening, both friendships and family is falling apart. We have gone from Cosby to Kardashian. That's the world that we live in. That's relationships today. And we have expectations that are running amok. Now, you might ask, well, why is that true? I believe the issue is expectations. The issue is we really don't know how to have healthy relationships because we have built up unhealthy expectations. In fact, we're conditions, conditioned from our very birth to expect things. I, I, I was in, in Walmart the other week um, and I was getting some things before my trip to Nicaragua. And, um, I walked in the store there and I was getting some travel supplies and I got in line and, and you've seen it, we've all seen it, you may have even been a participant in that. And I watched as a little girl, probably three or four years old, started asking her mom for one of those candy things. I think it's actually an absolutely cruel thing that the stores put those candies right in the checkout line. Now, they know what they're doing because they know you're going to buy them. And they put the magazines there because they know people on the way out will be like, oh, that's not too bad, I'm going to buy that. But I think it's absolutely cruel for kids. Because there's a candy bar, and this little girl begins to cry. Mommy, I want the candy bar. And mom says, no, no, you, you got to eat lunch first. Mommy, I want the candy bar. She begins, to, at two or three, three years old maybe, she begins to cry. I want the candy bar. Right? And she's crying. She's kicking and screaming. She's in the cart. She's shaking the entire cart. And mom's like, stop it. You need to quiet down. You need to quiet down. And what ends up happening? You know, the, you know how this goes. What ends up happening? She keeps doing it, and mom then says, Fine, would you just stop? And gives her the candy bar. What did she just do? And I know Pastor Brian spoke about this last week. What she just did is gave in to the condition of expectation. What she just did is gave in to this entitlement culture that we live in that means I'm going to do this for you and I expect this in return. I will do A, but I better get B. And we all live these reciprocal relationships, these conditional relationships. And that is why we live in a world, live in a country, live in a place, in a culture where people feel more alone than ever before. They feel more alone than ever, ever before. And as we started this series, we said this, expectations are the doorway to disappointment. It, it, it actually are preconceived resentment toward people. You will, eventually, uh, you will eventually feel resentment to the people that do not match your expectations. From marriage all the way through to coworkers and life, your unmet expectations will become your experience in life. Now, Luke chapter 6. Jesus is addressing relationships. In fact, in Luke chapter 6, this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus, probably the longest sermon. It is the longest sermon he preached on earth. In Matthew, we see it span three chapters, Matthew 5 through Matthew 7. Here in Luke chapter 6, Luke gives us kind of a highlight of it. He's standing along the seaside and he's teaching people. And specifically, he's teaching his followers because he says to them multiple times, he who has ears, let him hear. It's for those who are able to hear it and see it that they're going to grasp this. And we begin in verse 27. He says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes your, away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away your goods. Do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Now what Jesus brings up here uh, in that last verse that we just read is a well-known law. We call it the golden rule. 
This actually stems back all the way to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19, where God says to the people of Israel, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Kind of in a, and not those exact terms, but that's the essence of what Jesus says, or what God says in Leviticus, and what Jesus says here in Luke chapter 6. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, how does that play out? How does that look? That's the question. Well, here's what's interesting. In their culture, here were the Jews who were under foreign occupation. In other words, they were being controlled not by their own, but by the Romans. Remember, uh, we see in the Old Testament, Babylon, then Persia, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and then you see the Greeks take over, and now the Romans are in control. And so literally, throughout the land of Israel, there really isn't a land of Israel. They're under the control of a foreign occupation. They're under the control of Rome. And so they were taught that the enemy is Rome. The enemy are Romans. The enemy is, are, are, are Romans. And so if you're talking about your enemy, the first thing that comes to your mind is a Roman, a Gentile, a Greek. And then there are other people that this overlaps to, like the Samaritans who are half-breeds, half-Jew, half-Gentile, and they're dogs. You don't like them either. And so they took Leviticus 19 and they pl- applied it only to their own community of faith. They applied it only to the Jewish people. They said, we ought to do good to others, and others there is, are, are Jews. We ought to do good to each other. We ought to take care of each other. But the Romans are, they're dogs. They're rejects. They're Gentiles. So we don't apply this to them. And Jesus comes on the scene very early in his ministry here and proclaims, no, instead, love your enemy. Now, what they taught, the Pharisees taught, is a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye. And they taught this idea that especially when it comes to Rome, this is the way you act. Jesus comes on the scene and turns it upside down. He is countercultural, and in fact, I would dare say even weird in some ways. Jesus comes on the scene and says, no, love your enemies. This is crazy talk. This is crazy ideas. He is, he is running contrary to every thought that they had and everything that they were taught, politically, economically, and socially. And he says, no, instead, I say to you, love your enemies. I mean, this is turning everything on their head. He, he, what he just did is said, I'm going to change the rules for relationships. You can't call them enemies anymore. Said you're supposed to love your enemies. Now, notice Jesus answers with three things. He tells them these are the three things this looks like. He's given them illustrations. First of all, notice he says, do good to those who hate you. So the first thing he says, instead of hating those who hate you, do good to them. He then says, bless those who curse you. So those who curse you, those who say th- things about you, bless them. And then pray for those who abuse you. So if you're being mistreated, pray for them. P- pray for them. Now, please know there's not this idea that he's like, if you're abused, that's great, keep being abused. And I want to make sure we understand he's not giving a blanket statement that there are no boundaries in relationships. Clearly there are boundaries we have to set. If you're being abused, you need to get out. Okay, that's probably not a healthy relationship. So there is a boundary here, but his point is this mistreatment of people. If they mistreat you, pray for them. You need to pray for them. And even if you have to get out, you have to pray. And so his point is this applies. Now, the question we have to ask, because he's using this analogy with enemies, is who are the enemies? What does it mean to be an enemy? And what does it mean then to love them? Now, for you and I, this is a bit distant from us because clearly Jesus was talking to people that were facing somewhat, somewhat persecution. They were under foreign occupation, and eventually his disciples are certainly going to face persecution. So I want to make sure this morning that we're not, just, we're not just applying this passage in the way of persecution. You and I aren't facing what they face or what many Christians face around the world in places like China and Iran and Iraq. We don't face what those Christians face. However, this still applies to us today because we live in a world where what we believe is becoming more and more offensive, is it not? Our one nation under God is beginning to be offended by that. So, so for example, we, we, we preach and teach that Jesus is the only way to heaven. That's offensive. I mean, th- that is a declaration. Jesus says, I'm the only way to heaven. In fact, what I would say is I don't believe that. I believe that Jesus said that and what Jesus said is true. So it's not that I'm just saying that Jesus is the only way to heaven. I'm saying Jesus said he was the only way to heaven. That's offensive in our culture. It's offensive to declare one way. Notice also, faith in Christ. We believe faith in Christ alone brings salvation. If you don't have faith in Christ alone for salvation, then you will be eternally damned. You will be eternally punished for not coming to Jesus. Now, let's be honest. That's a biblical reality, and that's offensive in our culture. Who are you to judge me? 
Who are you to say that I'm going to get eternal punishment? How, who are you to say that I deserve hell? And, and let's be honest, I would say, I'm not saying that. That's what the Bible says. It's offensive. There is a bit of offense to this. I mean, I mean we, we call promiscuity and selfish ambition and pride as contradictory to God. In other words, we call it sin. Oh, I can't say the word sin anymore. What is sin to you might not be sin to me. What's right for you may not be right for me. What's bad for you might not be right. That's the culture we live in. The Bible is going to be offensive. In fact, I would dare say this morning that if you are a disciple of Jesus, you are going to have enemies. And the longer we live and the longer we live with the Bible in mind, in discipleship format, what is going to happen is this passage is going to have to be more of an appropriate passage for your life because the longer we live and the farther, the bigger gap that continues to be created between culture and church, the more this passage is going to be real because we're going to become more and more offensive in their minds. That's reality. In their world, it was offensive. Okay, We're starting to see that happen in our culture as well. And so this passage relates to us. However, good sound interpretation of this passage doesn't negate other application here. And let me show you what I mean. Because Jesus gives a few illustrations to this point that make me think he means something different here or deeper here than just what you see on the outside. In fact, take a look at his, he gives some illustrations. Take a look at verse 28 or 29. He says, to the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. So is he saying, if you get punched in the face, you ought to go, that was a pretty good shot, but I want to try this one over here. You might get a better shot on this one. Is that what he means here? Um, is this literally turn the other cheek? So is this kind of the Rocky Balboa form, right? Because Rocky just gets punched up and kind of like, oh, you're not so bad, you're not so bad, right? Is that the idea? Is, is that what he's saying here is we just turn the other cheek and keep getting punched? What's interesting is the question is how did Jesus apply this to himself? Remember John chapter 18 when Jesus is arrested and he's taken before the Sanhedrin? We don't have time to look at all of it, but he goes before the high priest and it says they punch him in the face. They, they, they punch him. And Jesus responds like this. He says, do you punch me because you've charged me to be guilty? You have not charged me yet. Where are the witnesses? Jesus challenges their punch. He, he doesn't just turn the other cheek, literally. He doesn't didn't say, hey, that was pretty good, but take this one too. Because the point here is not this kind of literal picture of we turn the other cheek. The point is something deeper, I believe, that Jesus is getting to. And the fact of it is, in John chapter 18, we see Jesus' response is, do you strike me because I'm guilty? Because they didn't have the right to strike him yet. They did not find him guilty. They, they had no witnesses against him. And so he challenges their, 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 their ability to punch him because the time wasn't right yet. They had not found him guilty. Notice the second illustration. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Now, a, a cloak was the outside garment. The tunic was the undergarment. Is Jesus here literally saying, if someone takes your cloak, give them your underwear? Is that what he's saying? Now, are there cases where that might be true? Oh, you need my cloak. Well, let me just give you my underwear as well. Um, you might need those because you need some undergarment too. Is that his point? No, I believe what Jesus is doing here is he's, he's, he's exaggerating the point. Now, believe, I don't believe this is, we should just throw this out. I think it's literal. But I think what he's saying here is it comes back to the working of the heart. That what Jesus is doing is saying, listen, there's something here that we have to consider in our hearts. How are we responding to people? In other words, this is not simply, this is not simply just an attitude we should have. This is a hard attitude that stands ready, that stands ready to suffer humiliation in order to offer love, that lets go of control and vengeance and allows God to have his way, that is submitting ourselves in moments of crisis and expectation, expecting nothing in return. That's what I believe he's actually saying here. He's getting right to the heart. It's not about whether you give somebody your underwear. It's not about whether you let the person pop you in the nose. The issue is what is our heart in expecting other people to give back to us? In fact, if we go back to those, that, those lines, the lines he gave, he says, do good to those, not only do good to those who hurt you. If you go back there, bless those 
who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If you go back there and you lay out what they say, do you know what's funny in that first statement? What is he really talking about? Do good to those, do good to those who mistreat you. And then he says, this is with actions, right? So our actions are transformed. We have different actions. The second one, he says, bless those who curse you. He's referencing our words, isn't he? When someone curses, we come back with the right words. In the last statement, he says, pray for those who mistreat you. He says, pray for them. Instead of prayer, instead of reacting, we pray. We, we react with prayer. Prayer is our excuse. Prayer is our out. Notice each of these things are getting to the heart of how, uh, how our attitudes work or, or how our attitudes need to be adjusted. How we respond by action, by words, or by prayer. This is the picture that he's painting there. So I believe in this text, the enemies here aren't, ne- aren't necessarily formal. I don't believe he's just talking about enemies of war or enemies of the state or enemies of battle. I believe he's talking about any place we've been mistreated, any person that we have been insulted by, any person who who has alienated us or taken advantage of us. Like This could be a friend who doesn't include you on a dinner. This could be a coworker who always has a sarcastic remark directed at you. This, this could be the boss who passes you up for promotion. I mean, this enemy here is not necessarily formal. This is anybody who mistreats us or builds an expectation that causes us to fail. And he says here in this statement, he says, instead, our actions, our words, and our prayers should be totally different for them. Our response should be out of the heart of submission rather than the heart of expectation. I deserve to get back. I deserve to have this. And he says, you know what, the goal of this is you love your enemies and expect nothing in return. In other words, what he does is flip our idea up and say, you can't have reciprocal relationships, you can't have conditional relationships. This is countercultural, this is radical, generous, and this is love. This is what it looks like. And I would dare say, there is no greater definition of love than in this passage. When he says, love your enemies. And that can only be found in Christ. It's only something that Christ would say. And, And I would dare say that Christ made it that difficult so that we would have to press into him to do it. That we would have to press into him to be able to fulfill this. That this is a calling of a full-fledged disciple is to love our enemy. Now, I believe he's going to go on here and he's going to define for us what this looks like in relationship. Take a look at what he says in verse 32. And I want to go through this over the next few moments and then we'll be finished. And here as he builds for us, this is what it looks like to love our enemies. Verse 32. If you love those who love you, What benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil be merciful, even as your heavenly Father is merciful. Now, what's interesting, I want to make a couple generic statements that come, I believe, from the text, applying this text to our lives. First of all, I find it interesting that Jesus, and I believe intentionally here, sort of defines for us who the enemy is. Do you you notice what he says? He he says in verse 32, "If if, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that of to you? If you if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit of that? Do you see what he just says there? That means that what enemies actually are, our enemies are people that do not give us what we expect. So the application point would be this. Expectations make enemies. Enemies are made by expectations. Isn't that true? Isn't that reality even in marriage? When are you enemies in marriage? It's usually when an expectation is not met. Where does every enemy stem from? Every enemy stems from the fact that there's an expectation that has been unmet, and it comes from a national scene all the way down to the personal scene. A boss doesn't give us the promotion we think we should have. There's an expectation. When it's not met, they're now the enemy, right? When the wife doesn't do or the husband doesn't do what we think he should do or she should do, there's an expectation not met. They become an enemy, right? When the church doesn't do what we think they should do, what happens? They become an enemy, right? So enemies, according to Jesus, are made by expecting something and not getting back what we expected. When we get back what we expected from the people we love, we get that. We love them. But when we don't get back what we expect, what happens? They become enemies. 
it's like they become enemies. There is a wall that is built up between us. It's funny, um, being down in Nicaragua, I think of even our, our history, right? When we think of our history um, and this idea of enemies. Um, Nicaragua is a, it's a, they have a dictator named Daniel Ortega. And it's interesting, I love talking a little bit of politics, although you have to be careful because you can never trust when somebody's listening to you. So we get into our vehicle and there's a little microphone and it makes you wonder, are they listening to the conversation going to come take us? And so we're talking a little bit about politics. It's interesting because their version of our political world is much different than our version. So for example, if you, were, you and I were to talk about what would be, who has been probably the greatest president of our generation? Probably almost all of us would say Ronald Reagan, right? But it's interesting because down there, Ronald Reagan is a bad word. Some of you are like, what? No way! That's the, no. But, but, but you know why it is? How could they say that about Ronald Reagan? Ronald Reagan tore down the wall of communism. But here's the thing. Do you remember the Iran-Contras? In Nicaragua, the U.S. government upheld a dictator named Somoza who abused the people, killed the people. And the American government upheld them or, or propped them because he would give back to the U.S. government whatever we wanted. Now, we know, and that's what a president is supposed to do, right, is look out for the interests of his own country. But what happened, the expectations of a foreign country are dropped. So in Nicaragua, when you mention, man, Nick, Ronald Reagan was the great, one of the great presidents maybe in our history, they look at that and say, are you kidding me? He was one of the worst presidents ever in American history. Expectation, right? Expectation. There's a different picture, by the way, I've learned, even in political world, there are two sides to every coin. I've learned that sometimes even the good things we do from our perspective in other countries can absolutely wipe them out and can hurt a lot of people. Now, is that true? And we know that our country needs to look out for the best for us, but it, it doesn't overlap to how we live as well. Well, I'm going to look out for my interests. I'm going to look out for myself, and I'm not going to look out for the interests of others. And so this is a play not only on the, on the national level, but also on the personal level with the way we live our lives. And here he says, what ends up happening without even knowing it is it can build animosity it can build disappointment, and it ultimately brings enemies. Now, on the flip side of that, can I just share with you for a moment? When we talk about enemies, on the flip side, when you give in to somebody else's expectations and become what you're not, if you live your life in fear or in guilt or of afraid of not being liked by somebody or afraid of being abandoned, and so you give in to the expectations of others based upon that, what you've just done is given in to an enemy. You become indebted to them. You become what they want you to become to fulfill their version of you instead of being what God has called you to become. And what happens? You've just built a wall. You just built, even by giving into that, by, be, by wasting your authentic self-expression of who you are in God, by, by giving into that, you spend time acting like someone else's fantasy. You've just given in to this idea of an enemy because now there's a bit of resentment that's going to build up toward that person, but you've allowed it. So you're just at a, as, a, as at fault. So Jesus here says, listen, an enemy in some sense is one who doesn't benefit us, who doesn't give us what we want, who doesn't give back when we think they should give back or, or doesn't give back when we lend to them. Secondly, expectations, and I would dare say unrealistic, I want to make sure we define that, unrealistic expectations or expectations that might be wrong can cause us to reflect the characteristics of unbelievers. Notice Jesus says here, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And you lend to those from whom you expect to receive. What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. He says, listen, if you have expectations and you're waiting for them to be met and they're not, what you look like is the same thing as a sinful person, a person who does not know Christ, an unbeliever. If you had to pick one thing throughout the Bible that's, that makes us stand out compared to the rest of the world, you know what the one thing is? It's relationships. We view relationships differently. It is the thing that causes us to send a text message to our neighbor to let them know we're mowing. Because I've got to be different. I've got to be different for their sake. Do I like it? No. Do I want to punch them? Yes. But we're called to be different. We're called to be sought in light. We're called to be the city on the hill, right? So my reactions have to be different. And Jesus here confronts that and says, listen, if you have an expectation and it goes unmet and you build the wall of an enemy or build the wall of something, then you're no different than a sinner. Or if you only build the expectation with somebody you know is going to give it to you, 
then you're no different than an unbeliever who only does it for themselves. You know what I find here? Is he is saying that ultimately it reveals, our expectations reveal our heart of selfishness. And you know what selfishness is, right? Selfishness is simply the inordinate preoccupation with myself, with me, myself, and I. So your expectations will reveal your heart. It'll reveal what you're really about. It'll strike at the motive of your heart in everything that you do for others. Are you doing for others because you expect something in return? Well, guess what's going to happen? You're going to make enemies because they're not going to give you what you expect. And it could be in your marriage. It could be in your family. It could be in your job. It could be in your neighborhood. They're not going to fulfill your expectations. And so he says, don't reflect the character of a believer where you give to get back. Thirdly, I believe he's defining for us a bit what a healthy relationship looks like. And I believe he's calling us to pursue a healthy relationship. So the question is, what does a healthy relationship look like? Take a look at verse 35. He says, love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Now let's stop there for a moment. It's interesting the word that he uses here. The word there that we have translated, expecting nothing in return. The word in Greek, it's a powerful word, is the word apelpizo. Apelpizo. It comes from the word pelpizo. Ah, pelpizo, and it comes from the word pelpizo. There's a reason I say that. I just, after I said that, I was like, that's kind of funny. Pelpizo from the word pelpizo. It's ah, pelpizo from the word pelpizo. Here's why that's interesting. The word pelpizo means despair. So Jesus here is defining for us what expectations do. Listen, this is, this is cool. Jesus says here, when you expect something from somebody, guess what's going to end up happening? You're going, to be, you're going to fall in despair. The person is going to fail you. They're not going to live up to what you expect. And so guess what's going to happen? You are going to feel despair. So he adds the all ah in front of that word, palpizo, and he says, instead, ah, palpizo. In, in, in Greek, when you add an ah to the front of it, it negates it. It's a negative. So in other words, he says, instead, give, but without allowing despair, because you have no expectation. Give, but don't expect anything in return. Don't do it for yourself. Do it because it's right. So he says, here's what a healthy relationship looks like. It is pouring into the life of somebody else, not expecting anything in return. Now, let's, for a moment, just a moment, think about Jesus with this. Did Jesus live this out while he was on earth? Now, I know we all say, well, he was God. Of course he did. But clearly, the Bible says to us in 1 Corinthians and many other passages that all these things are written for our benefit so that we become like Christ that we pursue these things that Christ pursued. So let's, I just want a moment to give an illustration of this through the text. Where did Jesus prove this point at the greatest? Wasn't it in the last moments of his life? Do you remember right before he went to the cross, before he was arrested, he sat with his disciples in an upper room. Remember that? We talked about that in the series, the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. Remember he sat beside Judas, who was going to betray him. He sat across from Peter, who was going to deny him. He sat around the table with all that were going to desert him. And this is what he says in the upper room with the disciples. John 15, 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than he lay his life down for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Now, he defines for us what a friend is. A friend does two things. Remember, a friend expects nothing in return. Here he says two other things about friendship in this passage. First of all, friends will do anything for you. Notice he says that the friend is willing to lay his life down. He's willing to lay his life down. Now, just for a moment, grasp that. A friend is willing to do anything for you. Listen, you might not be able to change your friends or control your friends, but you can certainly control your relationships. 
you can certainly, you can't control your friends, but you can control who your friends are. You can control your friendships. So the question is, do you have friends in your life as Jesus, now here's Jesus around a table with all who are going to desert him. But he looked at him and said, here's what a friend is. Let me show you what a friend is. A friend is someone who's going to lay their life down for you. And what was Jesus saying? He's the perfect friend, right? He's going to lay his life down for them in spite of the fact they're going to reject him. A friend is someone who's willing to sacrifice. Now, you and I, let's be honest, and last week we celebrated Memorial Weekend where we we recognize those who have given their life for our freedom, right? We memorialize those who have died for our freedom. Many of us will never be asked to take a bullet for somebody else. Probably very few of us will actually be asked to take a bullet for our spouse. Now, I don't know about you, but I would. I would dive in front of a bullet for my wife. For my kids, I will, I will walk through the coals for my kids. I will take a bullet easily for my kids. Now, for you, I'd have to really think about it. I love you. I do that. I love you. I love you. I'm being honest, though, right? And you wouldn't for me. If a madman came in here, they're not, you're not jumping up. You're going to hide into the chair. You're going to say, get him. He's the pastor, right? I know how this works out. I'm just kidding. We, we do have a security team, and they are... They are sworn to the oath of, no, I'm just kidding, there's no oath. There is a security team, but there's no oath. Um, I can't tell you who they are. When I give them the sign, they know to come. Very few of us will ever have to live out the reality of that verse, to lay down your life for your friend. Jesus did. And yet they were deserters, betrayers, and deniers. So here we are in our relationships are we sacrificing? You want, to know, you want to know whether you're willing to make the ultimate sacrifice? Are you willing to make the daily sacrifice? See, love is not just being willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. Babe, I will take a bullet for you, baby love. No, am I willing to daily sacrifice for her? Sacrifice myself for her? See, if I, I would never take the step of the ultimate sacrifice if I don't first take the daily sacrifice. And I think Jesus understood that when he, and he put all the scriptures together, when he says, take up your cross daily and follow me, he was saying, listen, the ultimate sacrifice may may not be the cross, it may be the daily sacrifice that you and I are called to give. And that's what a true friend is. A true friend is willing to make a daily sacrifice to help us become more like Christ. And I would dare say Christ has to be the picture. He says here, friends are willing to lay down their life. Secondly, He says, friends will do anything for you, but friends also will share everything with you. I find it very interesting here that he goes on and says to them in John 15, he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends for all that I have heard from the Father I have made known to you. A friend, Jesus says in that passage, is someone who is willing to share everything with their friends. Friends, they're friends. That's who a true friend is. Willing to say, I'm sharing with you life. I'm sharing with you what this life is about. By the way, it's a really cool thing we don't have time to dive into, but I would challenge you to do a study in the Old Testament of friendship. You're going to find one of the things that friendships over and over again is talked about is this idea of secret things. Psalm 25 says it this way. It says, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he reveals the secrets, literally, in the Hebrew. He makes known to them his covenant. There is something about a friend who reveals secrets. Now, let's just be honest for a moment. That is absolutely difficult to live in a Facebook culture. The average Facebook user has 125 friends. And Facebook, I believe, has changed the definition of friendship. Well, they didn't respond to me. They didn't write me back. They didn't like my post. They didn't say my picture looked good. They didn't say my hair looked good on that picture. And what happens, uh, Facebook has made more enemies than it has friends. I really believe that. It has torn people apart. Now, I know we laugh about that, but it's true. It's absolutely true. Because here's where we're at as a culture. Here's where we're at as a culture. We are willing to tell, we are willing to share anything with everyone. I'm sitting in my bathroom and I'm thinking about life. Is that necessary? I like um, Angel Soft better than anything else. Do we really need to know that? I'm eating this food at this time in this place in this way. I'm right. We share anything with everyone, but we don't share everything with anyone. 
That's where we're at as a culture. We share every, or anything with everyone, but we don't share everything with someone. We don't have people that we're sharing life with. We don't have people that we're... And, and this is the picture here, and I believe Jesus understood that. Proverbs 27 says this, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. We need someone being honest with us in our life, telling us truth in our life, speaking truth, not just building our expectations and doing everything we want, but telling us honestly how we become more like Christ. That's what we need. Listen, the wounds of a friend are a good thing. To have a friend who's going to be honest about you in life, not just expecting you to give you the good report about yourself. In fact, I would dare say to you, friends who praise you for nothing will be the first to stab you in the back. A true friend, and Jesus understood that, he looked at Judas and said, you're about ready to betray me. He looked at Peter and said, you're going to deny me. He looked at all of them and said, you will be cast away from him. What was he doing? He was giving them truth. And truth sometimes hurts. And that was not what they expected or what they desired but he was willing to be honest with them because he loved them. See, folks, we need friends who will be absolutely honest with us. You don't need a friend who's constantly going to tell you how great you are. What I have found in life is I, don't, I already know I'm great. The problem is I need someone to tell me I'm not. <laughs> Amen? Am I right? That's what I need. I need someone to remind me I'm not that great. I need someone to look at me and say, Dave, you've got you to work on this, man. And I'm thankful for the friends in my life who are being honest with me. They're challenging me. They're saying, Dave, what are, what are you looking at? What are you thinking about? What are you? They're challenging my life. Was, that's a friend. Listen, I don't need somebody to pat me on the back because I know if they pat me on the back, they can also stab me in the back. I want somebody who's going to be honest with me. Yes, encourage me, but we're always looking for encouragement. You don't know, I want to be real raw with you for a moment. I hear a lot of people say about the church, man, I just don't have any friends. I don't have any friends. You know why you probably don't have any friends? Because you're not willing to let them be honest with you. Because the issue probably is not them. The issue is probably you. And when you say friend, what you actually want is someone who is going to call you every day and tell you how great you are instead of having someone being honest with you and tell you, listen, you need to back down a little bit. Some of you, your expectation of a friend is they need to be on the phone with you for an hour every single day instead of it being, no, I need a friend who's going to be honest with me in key moments in my life. Listen, if I'm going to choose a friend, I want somebody who's going to tell me how I can become more like Jesus. That's what I want. I don't need to talk to them every day on the phone. Now, am I saying you shouldn't talk on the phone with a friend? Sure. Uh, there are friends that I have that I can talk to once a month, and whenever I talk to them, it's effective. It's good. A friend will ex never reject me for who I am, but also will never leave me where I'm at. That's what a friend does. Now, let's go back to Luke 6, because I think Jesus is actually in the midst of this saying, hey, you, you, you don't expect anything in return. Give, love, and don't respect, expect anything in return. In fact, Jesus says, I sh I'll show you this. And in John 15, he demonstrates it. I'll give my life. I'll share with you the truth, even though you're, you're going to question it. I'm going to tell you the secrets. I'm going to be honest with you, even though at first you're going to reject it, but this is what God is going to do. He, was, he gave his life, and he shared with them all the truth. And I want to end with this. Notice verse 35, and this would be the last point, and then we'll finish Christ is calling us to a better expectation. I love this. Notice what he says. Verse 35, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Do you know what he says there? He says, listen, when you have expectations of other people, you're asking them to fulfill that expectation. That's earthly. He says, instead, our expectation should be something greater. Now, very quickly, I know we're running out of time, but I want to share a couple things with you. He, and I believe our scripture is inspired in the original autographs, in the original writers, when they wrote it, it was inspired. And these words, I think, are inspirational. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Notice what he says in verse 32. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? The word benefit, there's multiple words in Greek for benefit. The word he chooses to use here in this text is the word um, charis. Now, if you were to study Greek, what you would find is the word charis is actually the word grace. The word gift is very close to the word charis. It's, it's a play on that. And so twice here he says, what grace do you get from expecting from them? We come down to verse 34. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive what credit is that to you? He uses another word there, and that word is the word elpidedze. That word is the word hope, elpis. 
It's the word hope. In other words, he says, are you expecting to receive grace from that person? Are you expecting to receive hope from that person? And then he says, listen, instead expect nothing in return, and what do you get in return? Grace and hope, wrapped in eternal, eternity. Instead, he says, your reward will be great. Why? Because you're gonna be made the sons of the Most High God. And he just turns this back to himself, and he says, do you not realize that, that God expects nothing from you? In fact, you're ungrateful and evil. I mean, I, I, I personalize these things, and I say, okay, Dave, you're ungrateful and you're evil, but I'm gonna lay my life down for you. I'm gonna offer you life. I'm gonna offer you forgiveness. And I'm gonna offer you redemption. And I'm gonna offer you salvation, not because I'm expecting anything in return, but because I love you. And the reward is eternal. Because what happens, we who are ungrateful and evil become glorified. Do you see the, God is the picture of this passage. We who, he, he was never going to get anything in return. He says, hey, if you expect nothing in return, there is a greater reward, an eternal reward that's waiting. Where we are called the most, the sons of the most high, the daughters of the most high. And remember, it's we who have been ungrateful and evil. We who God couldn't expect anything from us because we couldn't give it to him. And what we would give would not be enough. He says, so God understands this process. God has lived this. God has done this for us by the cross and resurrection. So he says, so this should be the way we live. Knowing there's a greater reward. Knowing there's something greater yet to come. In other words, I have the lowest expectations for people on earth combined with the high ex expectations for myself, and what does that do? That will bring the greatest expectation of rewards. I do what I do because I know it's going to affect eternity. I know it's going to affect eternity. Listen, you're here this morning, you say, no, I'm looking for a person like that. I'm looking for a friend like that. Maybe you ought to quit lurk, looking and searching and start being the friend that you want to have. Maybe for you, instead of pursuing uh, this relationship to get better, maybe your pursuit should be Christ, right? Your sh pursuit should be the better expectation. You're here and you're, you're in a bad marriage. Maybe your expectation needs to change from your spouse to the expectation of there's eternal reward for this. I'm living without getting anything back and I know it is going to be repaid to me tenfold in eternity. By my faithfulness here, there is a greater reward when I will realize more and more that the one who could expect nothing from me can make something of me. That's the picture he gives. How do we respond to this? You know, if you're mistreated, obviously the call is to respond in love. If you're, maybe there's been somebody who's hurt you deeply in the past and we're not saying that you should be abused. We're not saying that you should, we're saying that maybe you need to forgive them. Forgiveness is not Forgiveness is not forgetting you're going to have the pain. You might have to deal with that pain. Forgiveness is not holding the sin to their account. It's saying, you know what, God, I leave them to you. I don't have to get revenge. Maybe this morning the issue is your expectations are unrealistic, and instead you need to say, God, you have expected nothing from me in return can make something of me so I could be of eternal value. Maybe that's, that's the perspective you need to take in your marriage or your friendships. Maybe you need to find a friend who's going to challenge you. I would love for us to be a church that treats people better than they deserve. All because we've been treated better than we deserve by God. Better than we deserve by him. For me, this passage has haunted me. That's why, in a good way, and that's why I want to treat my neighbors differently. Listen, everything in me doesn't want to text them. Every time I text them, I want to say, forget you. But I do it, why? Not because I'm just crazy. It's because... I, I want the opportunity for them to see something different in me and hopefully turn to Christ. It's got to be our hearts. They don't deserve anything. You're right, but I don't either. I don't either, and that's the point. Let's stand together as we pray this morning.